Welcome to week six. So good to see everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, we are literally over the hump of the halfway point, which is fantastic. <laughs> I'm excited for this week, not only because I'm co-presenting with the amazing Paula Hayes, CEO of Hugh Noir, and also one of our cohort facilitator mentors, as you guys know, but we have we also have one guest that I'm aware of that's joining. And then also we we likely will have one other guest. Let me check really quickly and see, is Jenny Kelly in the room from the Kaufman Foundation? I am. I just joined. Oh, good. Welcome, Jenny. We're so excited to have you. And I know you're seeing a bunch of amazing faces pop up. Um, these are our, this, as you know, our tech accelerator cohort. I just want everybody to know Jenny Kelly is a friend from the Kaufman Foundation um, based in Kansas City. They have previously funded us for advocacy work around entrepreneurship. And then um, she's joining as a guest today to learn more about this program. But Jenny, I wanted to just give you a moment to um, introduce yourself to everyone and tell them why you're interested in the program. Yeah, thanks so much, Caroline. And thank you all for letting me join your program today. I'm really excited to hear more about what y'all are learning. Um, like Caroline mentioned, my name is Jenny Kelly. I'm a senior program officer here at the Kaufman Foundation based in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and so we fund uh, a number of grant making opportunities in the education and entrepreneurship space. Um, and so just really excited to learn more about what is going on here. Um, we recently released a new strategic plan. So just kind of um, looking for, you know, opportunities of what's going on in this uh, ecosystem and entrepreneurial space. Um, I also help run our fast track program, which is, is an early stage and startup curriculum. Um, and so just I'm really interested in learning more about what you guys are learning as part of this accelerator. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here, Jenny. You're welcome to stay as long as you want. We'd love to have you join one of our breakout rooms if you are able to stick around during that time, we have 10 breakout rooms. As you can obviously see, it's a very large group. Um, we've had 89 apply, 77 accepted, and many co-founders come in, in in the sessions as well. So thank you for being here. Um, I also wanna take a moment, and you guys know so some of you who are working on becoming fund ready, or you believe you already are fund ready, Lizzie's gonna throw in the chat the link to the Pitch Coach eligibility form. So for those of you who haven't filled it out and believe that you are ready and you are raising actively raising capital within the next few months, please fill that out. I think 15 of you have already filled that out. As you know, we have myself who will be a pitch co coach, Corey Wright, who's within a, a fund in Germany, who is from Corvallis and also has done a lot of work with Rain, has been on the team, has raised capital himself. But we also have another guest with us today. I want to give her an opportunity to do a quick introduction who will just join the team, I think, as of like yesterday, the scope of work was signed, right, Anjit? And um, she's got an incredible background, is also going to serve as a pitch coach. So Anjit, please introduce yourself to the amazing group of entrepreneurs. Hi, everyone. I'm very, very happy to, to be here. I love working with entrepreneurs who are um, the most inspirational people in my mind to be around. So um entrepreneur and founder of a digital video advertising company, um, grew that business from a concept over a decade ago, the, um, various stages of, of building the business, uh, went through the 500 Startups Accelerator a cohort um, and the relationships and the experience that that brought me, um, went through, um, and also, um, you know, I, pretty much every role you can think of um, operationally um, scaled the business and exited last year. So I'm um, very happy to, to be here. I love working with entrepreneurs and I really look forward to helping you guys um, perfect your narratives as you move through this next uh, stage of your, your business growth. So excellent. Thank you, you Anjit. And your audio was in and out again a little bit. So, um, so but sorry. I, that's okay. I think the gist of it came across. <laughs> And well, also I will work on this. So. And also you're welcome to stay as long as you would like as well. We can put you in a breakout at, at a later point in the program too. So thank, thank you. you for being here. And thank you, Jonathan and Melissa for co-hosting and invite and, and making sure that folks are making it into the room while we focus on the program. Okay. So with that, I'm going to pull up a couple of slides that, um, we need to walk through. As you guys know, the accelerator is funded by the US EDA, but also we have a new funder, the Washington State Micro Enterprise Association. They'll be joining at a later session to tell you more about what they do and who they are. 
but they're really helping cover the funding to fund your cohort facilitators and mentors and pitch coaches. So when they do come on board, please thank them when they join. As you know, we have our venture fund partner, Portland Seed Fund, and as well as Lindy and Heather from Rational Unicorn. I know they're not doing a, um, a spotlight today, but she'll be moving her spotlight to a future session. So thank you for being here. Also, you guys took the um, the survey that I had sent out, which was great, that mid-program survey, 57 of you took it. Thank you so much for doing that because if you don't tell us what's happening, it's hard for us to respond. 95% of you said it was okay to share your contact info with the cohort. So that link is in the, in the resource folder. And then 88% of you said yes, that you wanted to be invited into a group channel. It's likely gonna be either Signal or Discord, but just stay tuned, that will be coming out in the next week or so. So a lot of good response because I know many of you want to be able to pitch to each other and there's potential partnerships that can happen within this group. So we wanna make sure that you're all getting the, the rich connections. Those, if we were in person, you know, we call it those, um, the, the, the natural collisions that happen when you're in person at a physical accelerator. So we want to be able to provide that. Also, you know, we leave week nine open so that it's the cohort's choice. And we did the, in the survey, the number one was raising capital. Now, when we talk about raising capital, there were, there were different levels of that. We've, we've got pitch coaching that's happening. So I don't know if that's going to help cover some of that for many of you, or if it's a different kind of capital needs that you're wanting. But then tie for second and third was a lot of you need help finding co-founders and hiring team. And especially those once you get funding and then making sure you're bringing the right team on, whether it's a technical team or a marketing team or a sales team. Um, and then it tied with sales and marketing. So what we decided to do is we're going to actually um, give you guys a little poll here to pull up. And you're gonna see these three choices and then there will be a fourth choice, which is to use week nine for pitch practice. So anyone who wants to practice their pitch could join in um, and others could listen and benefit from learning through that process. OK, so basically, I want you guys to know that whatever response we get here is going to be what week nine is going to be. So I'm going to launch the poll and I will share the results on this. So hopefully you guys are all seeing the poll. Great. All right. Give it another few seconds. All right, we've got almost 60 of you or 60 of you have taken the poll. So I'm going to end it. Okay, so the winner is raising capital. And it's closely behind, um, well, not closely, sales and marketing. So raising capital. Okay, so what I want to do is actually give it a second for you guys to, let's stop share here. Just um, I throw in the chat or raise your hand. And a, a few of you, just tell, tell us more, what are you looking for around raising capital? And then when someone shares, and if you agree with what they're saying, use the thumbs up um, emoji on the, um, at the very bottom, there's a reaction button for some of you who aren't familiar with where that is. And then you can use the, the raise hand. So Stephanie and then Olivia. Hi, so I've been in a lot of meetings over the last couple of weeks, been invited to talk to boards. I was just on like the French American panel um, on women raising money <laughs> and being financially responsible. And I think about it every day running a business. And, uh, the question is, is that I'm literally like on stage, shoulder to shoulder with VCs, women running, you know, VCs for women. And yet I don't feel comfortable asking them for a meeting, <laughs> mm. and, but they're really interested in everything I'm doing. And, and I can tell, you know, you kind of get those nonverbal signals where they're mirroring you and aligning with you. Like, wow, I too worked for Google News, an aggregator. That's really interesting. I'd like to know more, but they didn't, since they didn't officially ask for a follow-up meeting, Caroline, I don't know where to go from there. Like, so in your experience or anyone's experience, is that a good chance to just be proactive and ask for meetings and, you know, share the three minute pitch, maybe the one minute pitch. I know we, we have to have every version of our pitches ready, but um, what are your thoughts behind it? Absolutely. Yes. Whenever you have a face-to-face -face with a person, 
ask, 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 always ask. And I can work with you on how to do that and how to feel like maybe more confident in just getting in there. Because what's the worst thing they say is no. I mean, you're the, you're the CEO. They're expecting you to be a salesperson. So lean into that for sure. Yeah. And use thumbs up if anybody else has any of that. And also thank you, everybody who's putting it in the chat. I see others thumb upping. That is good data. We're gonna That's going to help us determine how to use week nine session. Olivia. And then Jarek. Yeah, we'll yeah, we've been working on our um, uh, revamping our, our pitch deck uh, this week and last. Um, and just uh, making sure that we're focusing the right amount of time on each kind of aspect of the presentation. Like when I think about a pie chart, you know, what percentage to allocate towards, um, you know, uh, the, um, oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking. Like thinking about your growth strategy versus your traction versus your um, market um, comparison, you know, and just making sure that that's really honed in. Obviously that'll vary, I think by, um, by company, but uh, just, you know, refining that understanding. Gotcha. <clears throat> and thanks for voicing that, Olivia. I think a lot of that will get addressed in the pitch coach one-on-one -on -one sessions mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank That's you. That's great. Yep. Jarek, and then we'll move into the program, but please keep putting in the chat because we're saving that and we will mine that data. Jarek, good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so I know investors all look at different things and find different things important. So I guess one of my core questions or areas of support would be overcoming objections and also being able to, um, you know, more or less classify investors, like what good questions to figure out uh, what certain investors care about. Um, so kind of A and B. That's and then great. other sources of uh, capital, I would say even outside of, you know, VC or VC adjacent uh, funds. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good one. And one of the extra sort of optional homework things I'll, I'll put out there, and I think I've mentioned this, at least in my pitch clinic when I did that, is find a fund. I don't care where they're located. It doesn't matter. Use it as just an exercise. Find a fund that you think would want to be, invest in your startup. Look at the portfolio companies that they've invested in. Find one that is a non-competitor, reach out to them on LinkedIn and ask them for a 30 minute so that you could find out what did, what was it like? Did they, how did they get the introduction? What was the meeting like? What was the due diligence like? What were the red flags that, you know, you need to worry about that when I did that, I didn't know what I was doing and I just was doing it. I was like, I'm going to go in because I'm a salesperson naturally. So I'm calling everybody and I learned so much. And then I was like, oh, I'm not going to go to that fund. That's not, that's not a good fit for me. So please take time to do that. I would love it if everyone who is raising capital did that with at least one company. And Sunita, we do have to move on. I'm sorry, but put your question in the chat or save it for the end so that we can make sure that we capture what it is that you want so that we can really tailor week nine for you. And then also you will be getting matched. Those of you who fill out that pitch eligibility form, you need to have it filled out and completed by close of day tomorrow, Friday, which means midnight, really, really by the end of day. And then we're going to start making matches with myself, Anjit and Corey. And if some of these things are addressed, let us know so that we can use week nine, maybe for some different topic areas. So this, you know, this is a very investigative, not prescriptive process. So we want to make sure that we're really sort of pivoting just like as a good entrepreneur does pivoting based on what the needs are. So thank you all for taking the time to do that. And we're going to hop right in. Um, I'm going to do my presentation on startup branding. This is one of my favorite topic areas. And I really feel like it was a differentiator in both of my two tech companies because I was so good at branding and sales. I was able to you know, not just in my startups, but when I worked for Palo Alto Software, I'll give some examples of how I really pushed through some really uncomfortable moments of getting, whether it's a, whether it's interviews with the New York Times or on stage in the middle of, of the largest real estate brokerage conference in New York, which is probably arguably in the world to pitch our tech. And it was literally from like heart beating, being nervous and just pushing through and doing it to get that to get that sale or to get that branding and positioning in the market. So I'm excited to talk with you about this. And then Paula is going to talk with you about 
real life stuff she's doing at Hugh Noir using AI to help with marketing that's saving time and money. So good programs for you today. Paul is going to use the raise hand feature when I hit the 15 minute mark. So that lets me know I have five minutes to wrap up. And then Paula is going to jump into her presentation. Then we're going to have some time for questions. And then we're going to do a breakout. Everybody ready? All right. Great. Well, thanks for being here, you guys. Okay. And again, put your questions in the chat as I'm going. So that way you don't forget them or write them down. Because also, as you guys hopefully have seen, when we when we share with you the recording, it has the chat saved off to the side that goes along with the recording. So we want to make sure we're, we're not losing that data. Okay. Startup branding. So what's wrong with this picture other than the fact that it's grainy? <laughs> and again, you can um, use the raise hand feature really quickly and chime in, or you can um, put it in the chat. And if somebody on my team can help monitor that, but what's wrong with this picture? What's going on here? No structural support. Yep. The bridge doesn't have enough. Where'd that go? Bridge doesn't have enough support to stay up. Well, well, yes, I just got my trademark. Da, 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 da. Let's see. Let's see. Defies engineering standard, not properly cantilevered. Okay. No customer centric. Okay. There it is, Susie. Great. All of these are, all of these are correct, but this is one of the mistakes. So many, not just startups, by the way, I've worked in large corporations like Bristol Myers Squibb Pharmaceuticals that they don't build. They should be, this is the startup team building the product. They should be over on the Island here with the customer, building it with the customer. We did this really well in both of my tech startups. And I'm telling you, it changed the product development. It changed our marketing messages. It also helped us raise capital because we were able to tell investors, hey, we're building this with the customer and this is what they're telling us that they want. So you definitely want to be over here on, on the customer side because not everything goes this way. What is this movie and what is the, the tagline here, you guys? Anyone recognize this movie? Build it, they will come. Field of Dream. <laughs> yes, yes, Field of Dream. And yes, Derek, thank you. If you build it, they will come. And wouldn't that be great? Yes, we all can't be Steve Jobs and sort of know, like, yeah, everybody's gonna have this tiny little mini computer we're all gonna carry around. So it doesn't always work that way. And if it does, I mean, kudos to you, but most of product development and you guys heard from Jim Gibbs in a previous se session is you really have to include the customer and because this is going to help you with how to position your, your product and your brand. So include your customers in your research and development. And depending on what it is you're doing, it's going to look different for different people. Um, in my first in my first startup, we realized we're building, basically, if you guys remember, we were Pinterest before Pinterest existed, but imagine only pinning health and wellness products, right? So it was very niche that we made a lot of mistakes. But what we did do well is we created this alert method, which is ask the customer, listen, implement, reward them, and thank them. Now, you don't want to, you have to have the right customer group, right? Because you don't want to think, oh, we're, we're now taking feedback from a group of customers that isn't the right customer and don't implement everything implement what you believe is really fits and aligns. So as I always say, 80% gut, 20% data. So you still have to heavily rely on your gut and listen to the words, asking them, what words did you use to find us? What words do you use to find other competitors when you're searching for us? Where do you go to find these products? Why are you searching for these products and really listen? And then, of course, many of you have probably read both of these books, especially those who have been in accelerators. The, these are really good, to, the lean startup, testing the business idea, just really helping. And this further follows through on what Jim Gibbs was saying in the, in the product development. So rapid experimentation needs to include the customer, it needs to include the customer so that you can understand where your sweet spot is right there in the middle to create that minimum viable product. Branding starts when you incorporate your company. It doesn't start after the product is built and you're like, oh, I just raised money. Now I have marketing money, right? There's branding and there's marketing. Your branding is anytime anyone interacts with you, whether they meet you on the street, you're speaking on a panel, you're delivering a, a keynote talk, or you're in a sales meeting, or you're running ads on Facebook or whatever, whatever your brand experience happens 
when you're creating your product and it will influence. It's that secret, you know, sort of heartbeat. That's why I use that heart to your product development. And, and you can't get there unless you do early market validation, which you've, you've heard us talk about over and over. And really branding is storytelling. You'll, those of you who attended the pitch session will, will recognize this image that everything, whenever you're talking about your product or your company, you should be telling stories. And those stories should be addressing whatever the problem is that you're solving in the market. Not talking about the technical specific specifications, unless that's the audience and that's what they want to know. And if you get to due diligence with some funds and you're heavily on heavily based on tech, they're definitely going to have someone ask about that. But we're talking about your outward presence, your storytelling approach. So here's another way to think about it. There is a... Um, there is this thing called TOMA, T-O-M-A. Has anyone ever heard of it? Put in chat if you have TOMA. TOMA stands for top of mind awareness. And this is something that happens. Large consulting firms do these TOMA surveys every year, and then they get the data and then they sell it back and use it to help with advertising and marketing and branding. Basically what they're finding out is what words does a brand owned in the mind of the consumer? And so you have to start thinking now, what words do you wanna own in the mind of the consumer? And we're gonna do some examples, but right now, what I want you to do is think about if you were about to give a speech. So I said, hey, you guys, you know, cause Caroline's really good at getting people on stage and getting you guys promoted and featuring you. If I was about to, to tell you, hey, Jarek, you're gonna go do a speech to a large audience and someone asked you, what is your talk about? You can only answer me in five to seven words. Jarek, are you okay if I put you on the spot for this one? Yeah, sure. I would say housing as a benefit. Housing as a benefit. To whom? Employers. To okay, there attract you go. and retain. Oh, gotcha. Yep. Sorry so about I would, that. I would was... that, no, don't ever apologize. This is, we're practicing and you just, came up with that on the fly. And I know you you also just gave a talk at Stanford. So you had a little bit of practice. So that's why I called on you. <laughs> Great job. But this is something you want to think about. It's a, it's a really sort of backdoor way of thinking about your tagline, your brand, your story, your whatever, you know, it, it, fill it in. But this is a really important exercise for you to think about. So what would you say your talk is? You're going to get interviewed. Oh, you just got invited to do a talk. What is it about? So great job, Jarek. That's what you want to think about. Okay, so now we're going to play a fun game. Some of you have probably played this fun game before, but what word does BMW own in the mind of the consumer? Throw it in the chat. Just unmute. You don't have to raise your hand. Great engineering. Great engineering. Okay, that's built, a good. Built tough. Built tough. Okay, what else? Unreliable. <laughs> that's I agree. like a that sounds like a personal customer experience. Uh, not as good as Mercedes, I love it. Carbon emissions, okay. So for years, you would open any magazine and if there was a, a BMW ad, the only thing it said was drive. That was it, because that's the word. They really want you, it's that German engineering. Are there other cars that drive better? Certainly, right? Do you feel like that there's different vehicles that you can get in and just really enjoy to drive. And it's a very personal thing, but BMW right out of the gate said, we want, we want to own this word in the mind of the consumer. So if people really enjoy driving and feeling the road and taking the corners and doing that, you know, not, all, not everybody gets to fly down the Audubon. Um, I had the pleasure of doing that once, which was fun, but drive, right? So that's the word as opposed to Volvo. What word do they own in the mind of the consumer? Safety. 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 Exactly. Are they the safest car on the road today? Not anymore. They, I mean, they're, they're still actually a pretty safe ride, but they own that in the mind of the consumers. I can't tell you how many of my friends, you know, this is going back, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago when everybody started having children and they were like, oh, that's it. Trading in my, um, my whatever car they were driving for a Volvo. I'm like, why? They're like, well, it's safe. It has all the airbag. So they really just sort of encapsulated that. And that is what they put in all their branding and all their marketing and everything. They want you to feel safe. They want you to feel like this is the place 
for you to put your family. How many people have stayed at a Four Seasons anywhere in the world? Yeah, it's one of my one of my favorite favorite hospitality experiences. What words do they own in the mind of the consumer? Luxury. Luxury. Yes. What else? Customer service. Yes. Service and luxury. I mean, you guys hit it. That's exactly every, any time I've probably stayed in two dozen, four seasons around the world. And it's because it's consistent. And, and by the way, I can go in the one in DC and they'll know my name and I can go in the one in Cairo, Egypt, and they know my name. Okay. So building a company means, or I'm sorry, <laughs> building a company means selling things which means building a brand, right? And you think you're growing a business? Yeah, I mean, yes, you're growing a business, but really what you're growing, you're, what you're building and growing is a brand, right? So know what you wanna own and how you're gonna defend it. That's also really key. And that comes with you know just consistent messaging, consistent branding, engaging your customers to speak on your behalf. There's nothing better still to this day than word of mouth marketing to have those customer testimonials, use them, use them, use them. And we're not gonna have time to go through all of these, but this is just something, again, these slides will be in the resource folder. What do you wanna be the go-to for? You know, Is there a niche that isn't being filled that you can fill? How stiff is the competition for the words you might wanna own? And can you differentiate yourself? And just ultimately, what are your ultimate goals? right? So that you want to associate your brand to reach them. So these are some things in branding exercises to think about. So again, a couple fun ones, internet videos, this changes over the years, right? What brand do you think of when you think of internet videos? YouTube. YouTube. Yep. What else? TikTok. TikTok yep. That's one that's sort of taking the mind share away from internet, uh, from YouTube streaming videos. Who owns Prime. that? Twitch, Netflix, Vimeo, Netflix, Vimeo. Yep, yep. And home improvement. Now this is a tricky one, depending on where you live. Home improvement. Home Depot. Yes, Craig, you've got Jerry's, Jerry's. Okay, most places in America, people will say Lowe's or Home Depot. In the Toma survey that goes out every year, the only, the only region in America that people do not, say Home Depot or or Lowe's, they still say it, it doesn't win. But the only region is the Willamette Valley, in, specific, in particularly in the Eugene Springfield area, people say Jerry's Home Improvement. They have done an incredible job of building the brand of being Home Improvement. Organic market. Again, it depends on where Whole you live. Foods. Whole Foods, Met Market. Right, new seasons, exactly. So you guys get get the gist of this. This is what you wanna do. You wanna be able to have a word or two words, no more than two words that you that the, that is owned in the mind of the consumer for you. And then really understand the value proposition of your competition because you're gonna have to defend that word in your marketing and in your sales. And that's done through customer um, testimonials. It's done through using some influencers. It's done through a lot of different ways. And we have the amazing Anjit on the call, who is going to be a pitch coach who also built her business, a lot of her business around uh, using video. Selling and marketing is listening. And so when I was at Palo Alto, I was um, the VP of sales and development. And we were, and they still are, the world's largest online business planning software. And at the time, we had set up all these Google alerts so that we could listen online. Now, of course, now we have like Twitter and Instagram and all these other places and Facebook and that we need to be listening to. We were also listening on Twitter, which is one of the exercises I'm going to give to you. Who here has Google alerts set up? And again, I can't see anybody. So you guys have to either use the, um, just throw it in the chat. Yeah. If you don't have Google Alerts set up, you need to. And if you're not sure what to set it up with, it should be your company name. It should be your name, your co-founder's names, the investor funds that you're looking for. If in the search query, it's two separate words, you have to put quotes around it. Otherwise, it won't return the results for that for those words put together. And then you can choose how you want it 
respondents so that you can listen online and you can get either an email digest or you, you can find out what's happening so that you can respond. So if you go to alerts.google.com, set them up. And then also Paula is going to be talking about um, marketing using AI. I will say that Google Alerts, there's a way to use chat GPT to generate social posts using Google Alerts as well. So here um, I was still listening on Twitter and um, there was a guy who said, hey, at Live Plan, thanks. I'd say this is an improvement over the old business plan pro. I was listening because I was checking on the at and then we went back and forth in a DM and then we started emailing and he was just so amazed that someone was actually listening from a large company and we set a meeting and this turned into a six figure sales sale. Unbelievable, right? And that happened over and over and over again. And it's because our brand and our positioning was about raising. Thank you, Paula. And so branding is positioning. How and where do you want to be positioned? Let's think about New York Times. So at, when I was at Palo Alto, we really wanted to get positioned in the New York Times. So I literally was tweeting um, Adam Bryant, who was the lead columnist for the corner office. And those of you who don't know what the corner office is, it's a full one page spread in the New York Times, which if you were to try and buy a one page spread in the New York Times, it would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> very, very expensive to do that. Of course, now it's different with digital and the, and the saturation of other news outlets. But I was pitching our CEO, Sabrina Parsons, to get her interviewed in the corner office. And when if we have more time, I can tell you more about the details and the specifics of that. But basically, he said, great. Let's do it. And I said, okay, awesome. Are we setting up a like a Google Meet or what are we doing? And he's like, oh no, you have to come to New York to get interviewed. So we went to New York and I'm telling you, it was an incredible experience to the point that I still have a connection with this guy, right? Like building the relationship, treating it, not just like, oh, he did this for us. No, he's a human. And when we walked into the New York Times building, we stopped at the coffee shop and I texted him and I said, we're in the lobby. Can I bring you up some coffee? I brought him up some coffee. He goes, in all the years I've been doing this, no one's ever done that. <laughs> I was like, what? Aren't people human, right? People get nervous. They're not sure of what to do or not to do. But that, that, uh, that article was a really great get. So you want to pitch yourself um, and start and, and your startup to three what in the next month. Right. So I want you guys to think about three publications. Is it three influencers? Is it three conferences? You need to start getting out there now. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter if you if you still have vaporware or what. You want to start thinking about getting your brand out there and create raving fans. Right. So these are the people who love you. You know, you don't need more than really 10 in the beginning. Just get some people who really love you and are willing to promote you and establish a vision for what you want to achieve. So let's go back to Cairo, Egypt, where I got to stay at this amazing hotel, um, this Four Seasons. And I want to use this as an example because this is what we're going to do on our breakout. So the Four Seasons, incredible brand, their positioning. We talked about luxury and service, right? So we're going to kind of do a little um, ad lib here. We're going to borrow it off of this statement of who they are, right? And fill in these little areas. Who loves ad libs? I loved doing those as a kid. They are super, super fun. For right now, we're going to go through this because this is what you're going to do in your breakout with your facilitator is you're going to work through, we have chosen to specialize within the blank industry by offering only exceptional what. Our objective is to be recognized as the company that what. Okay. Again, this starts to, it gets you into your branding muscle and you may end up using different language than the way that the Four Seasons, because they're a hotel, right? They're hospitality. But you'll get the gist of at least you're figuring out what these areas are that you want to excel in. And really reward those who already love you. And don't pay them. We made that mistake in my first tech startup, because when you start paying someone, even a customer, what's it turn into? A job, <laughs> Right. So you don't want it to be a job. You give them free tickets to something, invite them into the product launch, um, whatever it is for your business that makes sense and keep asking them what else do they want and keep delivering it. Remember, if you don't position yourself in the market, others will do it for you. Look at the brands that are out there that don't do really good branding. You already know in your mind where you position them. It probably isn't where they want to be. So with that, I'm going to stop.
hopefully that was enjoyable and fun. I really love doing the branding work and I would love to be able to do more one-on-ones with you guys. We can talk more about this when we actually do our, um, those of you who are doing the, the pitch coaching with me as well. So save your questions. We're going to move over into Paula so we can keep the flow of marketing going and then um, we'll have some time for questions. So Paula, hand it over to you. Love that. Caroline, you finished with time to spare. I didn't even barely felt like I needed to give you an alert. So thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm actually really excited to be here. It's been fun to be a facilitator, but um, I want to talk to you all about the kinds of ways that you're going to be able to take all these things that you've learned. If you think about all the sessions that we've had, whether they've been about validating your product, understanding your product differentiation, your um, customer personas, the pain points. And as you start to think about what comes next as it relates to marketing, I know it can feel daunting. I say that from my perspective, being an entrepreneur um, in an industry that is relentless in terms of competition and marketing. So what I really want to do today is to level set for you all just around the, the, the simple concept of what marketing is in a marketing strategy. But then I want to start to share the kinds of tools that are out there that you potentially could use to uh, execute on whatever your marketing strategy is. So I'll start in preface and you will hear me say this over and over and over. My examples are only examples. Um, different businesses will require different channels, different messaging, et cetera. It's all dependent on your customer. But I hope that what I do is give you a little bit of, um, of an idea of what's possible for you to think about in this area and how you could incorporate some of the AI and tools that are out there in order to, to, to execute. So I'm gonna share my screen. Second here, if you guys can see that, can someone give me a thumbs up? Yep, we can see it. Okay, all right, great. So again, Marketing with AI for startups. And again, just think leveraging, leveraging, leveraging. We all know that you're busy startup entrepreneurs. You have a lot on your plate. Your team potentially is stretched thin. And so you're supposed to be able to do this effective marketing to reach your audience and give them personalization. Well, honestly, without tools, it's going to be really, really, really hard. So I think of marketing as the art and science of storytelling, building brand awareness and reaching your customers. It's really that combination of all the, these great things that you've been putting together. There are a lot of um, tools that you wanna make sure or things that you wanna make sure that you have ready to go when you're thinking about doing and marketing your business effectively. Marketing really is getting the right message to the right customer at the right time. In this, you've got to really think about what it is that you, is going to allow you to do that effectively. And that's the elements that make up your marketing communication, right? It's understanding and articulating what makes your product different. It's the value proposition. So why should your customers care? What is it that you're that that you potentially are saving them from helping them to thrive with um, or just you know ultimately providing value for them? And the final thing is matching that and mirroring that with your customer personas to again make sure you're talking to the right people at the right time with the right message, right? All of this starts with making sure that you're first building a, a marketing strategy. So putting all those pieces together, and that's kind of what I mentioned that of wanting to level set on. Um, but you really want to think of your marketing roadmap as your, um, your North Star for making sure that you're connecting to your right customers. And it really is just that your strategy is really a roadmap. It's going to help you to make the most of your marketing efforts and it's gonna make sure that you can stay focused in a sea of marketing opportunities. 
You guys may already be contacted. I know that my business, we are inundated all day, every day with companies who want to provide the next best thing as it relates to marketing. And it can be really easy to get distracted with all these things. So if you have a strong strategy to start with, you know that you are going to stay on track and ensure that you can ultimately reach your goals with the least amount of distraction as possible. So what are the basic principles of having a strong marketing strategy? These are the things that you want to make sure whatever strategy it is that you're building for your business that you have in place. First, you want to make sure that you have strong goals. So what is it your business wants to accomplish with whatever that marketing tactic is? Are you looking to increase awareness? Are you looking to generate leads? Do you want to enhance customer loyalty? Whatever it is, just make sure you start with a goal. The second is to know your audience. Well, you guys are getting a lot of good practice about really understanding and knowing your audience. Again, that will ensure that you're getting the right message to the right customer. And you're not wasting your time somewhere where, where you're not supposed to be. Um, third is to understand your marketing mix, your, your four Ps. I'm not sure how many of you know this phrase, your four, the four Ps, but that is the combination of your product, your price, the placement of, it, of your product or service, and the promotion of it. Understanding that mix and what's right for you in that mix is going to, again, keep you on track when it comes to marketing. You want to make sure that you're monitoring, you're moni monitoring your key performance indicators. You, you want to know that, that you're on the right path. Marketing is one of those things that can get spendy very quickly if you're not staying on top of what it is you want to accomplish whether or not you're getting any sort of return on your time or the money that you're spending. And it's something that, you know, I, at least I, I've seen in, in my own experience, it's a luxury that a lot of startups just don't have. There are a lot of brands that have received, you know, um, they're a little further along where they've received a ton of funding and they can afford and they sometimes do just throw money at the problem to market and be out there in as many places as they, as they can and, and hoping that, that something sticks. You often see it in big companies that, again, don't really have to you know, make sure that they're maximizing their resources. They can try a lot of different things. But you want to make sure that as a small business with uh, resources that might be outmatched by, you know, the industry that you're in, that you are really tracking what it is that you're doing, that you're seeing results um, um, developing, and that you are ultimately um, making the best use of both your, your time and your money and getting your message out there. And the last piece is just to make sure that you level set on the fact that a strong marketing strategy will evolve. Um, this for me was likely, it was the most frustrating thing about marketing. Um, technology changes, things evolved. The landscape is always shifting. I know I found it kind of frustrating to feel like, oh, we've got it. Whatever that channel is, we are now coasting. We've got it down to a science. Everything is ready to go. And then something would shift. So think of something like TikTok, right? That wasn't around 10 years ago, but how many businesses have moved over to that as a platform that, that they are using to um, market their business? All of these things, all of these elements of what is considered a strong marketing strategy can be enhanced with um, AI. So I wanna talk about leveraging uh, AI in order to maximize your um, marketing efforts. And this is something that my business, we really embraced. And we really think of it as our essential part of our marketing strategy. It's my it's my and it's our virtual marketing assistants. They do a lot of the grunt work for us. They do a lot of the things behind the scenes that allow us to make best use of our time um, and efforts. And so I wanna show you again, just as an example, so you could start to think about how you can incorporate tools that are out there um, in your own business. I'm gonna share with you just some of the examples of a few things, not all the things, but a few things that we are doing in my business in order to maximize and leverage uh, AI in our marketing efforts. 
and the reason why we've in, in, we're incorporating these things is because it really does enhance or elevate what our marketing strategy is. So it is really about that enhancement that helps to make sure that we are as effective as we are. So instead of just the right message, for us, it's about the right personalized message to the right targeted customer at the right specified time. And so all of the tools that we're using for AI are helping us in these areas. So the benefits for us, and, and they are for a lot of company, first, we save a ton of time. I have examples. Uh, first example I'll share with you, we are saving um, weeks and weeks and thousands of dollars by incorporating AI. Um, efficiency. Um, the ability to analyze our audience engagement and to measure performance really helps us to make data-driven decisions. And finally, personalization. For a business particularly like mine, um, that's about meeting individual goals and everyone's style and preference is a little different. That personalization has become so important to, to make sure that our marketing is really effective for our customers. So our first, my first example is in content creation. So think of content creation. It could be anything from just generating simple copy. It could be your website content, emails, social media posts, et cetera. For us, one of the biggest areas that we've incorporated this, and again, I, I think of content marketing as not only essential, but it really is a beast to feed. It covers all those areas. For us, it's, it, it's in our blogs. Um, we use AI to generate high quality content. So I know that this screen might be a little hard to see, but what I'm showing you here is a resource that we use called AnyWord a a Any Word AI. And there are a lot of tools inside of AnyWord AI, but this is their blog wizard. So the screen that you see is more of a... Um, uh, it's the one of the final pieces that we get from AnyWord AI, but what it allows us to do is to move from a, a strategy where we would come up with a topic that we wanted to cover with an audience. We'd find one of our copywriters who might be able to do that work for us. We'd negotiate the price. They would tell us it was gonna be about six weeks for them to turn it around, probably for a thousand or more dollars. And finding someone to do it even faster was almost impossible. And sometimes if we went with maybe our second choice or someone we didn't know, we'd get copy back and we'd end up rewriting it all together. A huge waste of time and money. What we're able to do with AnyWord AI is we simply plug in our topic. So in this case, we wanted to create um, a, a spring cleaning beauty routine. We can tell it exactly what our personas are. We can, uh, it knows now what the pain points of, of our customer persona and target market is. We can tell it the number of words that we need it to be. We can um, lay out the tone of voice. We can do all that on the front end and what any word AI within a matter of a minute or two, it will spit out potential topics, uh, titles that speak to this particular market that we're going after. It'll tell us percentage-wise um, how it's likely to generate as a topic or title with consumers to get them clicking. And then once we tell it that we're okay with it, it will spit out an outline. We can update the outline very quickly of, of, of the different uh, headings for the sections that we wanted to cover within another minute. We can tell it, yes, we like this, we like this lineup, or no, let's regenerate and try something new. Um, but at the end of the day, within five minutes, we tell it to generate, it creates the full content, it then spits out a screen like you see here, where it tells us the readability score, how readable it is, the number of words, how much time it's going to take. It'll check for plagiarism. It makes sure that our keywords that we set up in the beginning are, are included and it follows our brand rules. We then simply take this and we give it to an editor who's already part of our team who can then make sure this really is the content that we want, that it speaks the way we want it to. We'll do any particular edits, we'll pull in the photos and we've gone from at a minimum two to three week turnaround if we were doing it uh, on our own. And as I said, sometimes it could be up to six weeks 
to ultimately being in a position where we can turn a, a full blog post around in a day or two. And any word AI costs us $39 a month for unlimited use. So again, ton of time savings, a ton of cost savings, and it's something that my team has been very, very, very thankful for. It's the idea of allowing them to do even better quality work um, with a lot less effort and the ability to get it out to our consumers faster so that we can continue to generate content as we need it. Our second uh, area is market segmentation. And for me, this is my favorite, to be honest with you. As I said, being in a business where we are um, trying to meet the needs of consumers with very varying, varying tastes um, and styles. Yeah. Five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Varying styles um, to be able to make sure that we are speaking and that we are uh, personalizing our messages to them. And so this is an area where we use AI quizzes. So it's a combination of both a quiz and them having a chance to take a photo and answering those questions on the back end. The results, um, our tool will generate um, tags that we then can not only um, use to both give them recommendations right there on the spot at the end of the quiz. But now if they've joined us as a customer, we can then personalize all of our emails moving forward. So this feeds into our email marketing platform where we can segment them. So for instance, if I have a, a customer who is a very dark skin tone, who really only likes nude shades of cosmetics and has very sensitive skin, I know specifically which products are going to be not only recommended for her, but any content that we generated is really going to speak to her individual needs. The third example was email marketing. And so just as I said that we're able to segment, now we then can take that information and create really personalized content. We do this through something, again, back to any word AI, they can do a ton of work. But for that customer that I just talked about, we now can then put together an email drip directly to her, welcoming her to our community um, with content that's going to speak directly and specifically to her. And we can ensure that we're not wasting her time and that she's going to have um, a lot better level of engagement because we're speaking directly to her. Um, so we love that. Another one that is really common uh, for everyone um, in any business, if you have a website is SEO, search engine optimization, efficiency, um, and effectiveness. We know that in order to show up among the millions and billions of websites out there, it really is important to make, to make sure that those search engines can find you. Well, we have used something called Keywords Everywhere. Again, there are other plugins, but what this allows us to do, it really allows us to make sure that any keywords that we're using either for products or on our websites are actually going to be effective and efficient. I can't tell you how many times initially we might think that we've got the best way to describe our product only to find out that it could be described better in order for search engines to find us. So I give an example here of our uh, page um, from my Google if I'm using any word key, uh, uh, keywords everywhere, and I am doing a search to figure out if the type the 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 keyword stream of makeup for mature skin really resonates, this actually tells me almost immediately. I don't know if you guys can see that there that about four thousand four hundred people search for that particular phrase or keyword, uh, long you know long tail keyword at any given time in a month that if I wanna use that word in any sort of marketing, here's how much I'm likely to spend, 78 cents per click in order to get that keyword. But the other thing that it does, it also tells me how much competition is out there. There's a lot of competition for the word. That's good, but the part that I like is this data over here. I can figure out trending information of how popular is this uh, for customers out there searching. But I can also see potentially things that are uh, better and better ways for us to communicate um, to our audience the, the right kind of keyword. So again, this is hard to see, but down here it shows 
related keywords. And so the very first one that pops up in this, again, example that I put together is we might do better if it really is a foundation product to market with foundation makeup for mature skin. That gets about 12,000 people per month who are searching for it. The cost per click is 27 cents as opposed to 78 cents here. It's still competitive, but there's still a lot of trending for that. So we use this in order to make sure we're tailoring our search engine optimization um, and the words that we're using in our website and in our materials to really make sure that it's resonated in the market. And the final one, I think is self-explanatory. It's the one that most people would think of. There are different ways to have performance metrics enhanced um, using AI. There are a lot of examples. My quick one here is just the way that we're using our performance metrics um, and some automations uh, with uh, Google ads to ensure that our ads are constantly evolving as, a, as AI information through Google is assessing our performance and it's set up so that we don't constantly have to worry about that. But again, those are just my examples. Again, no, not one size fits all. Not These may work for you. These are common examples, but there are other things that may be really effective for your business. My whole point is that if you take an understanding of your not only product and things that, and service that you offer, um, if you understand your personas and you use the resources, you can combine that in a best practice to use your insight to make sure that you are reaching your customers the way that you want. Doing this is really just the idea of harnessing the power of AI to make your job a little easier and more effective. Um, this can become a very daunting task, this marketing piece. So I just want to encourage you to find tools that are going to help you to leverage the time you have and your resources to do the best job. And that's it. Well done, Paula. Give Paula a round of applause. Always, always love hearing your talks. And I think this is now like the third time that we've had you back to talk about various things. And I also did not introduce you properly <laughs> because we've had you on each session, but could you please you know, remind everyone who you are, your background and the capital that you've raised or just a little bit more about you? Yeah. So again, Paula Hayes, hi. Um, Cunoir <laughs> Cosmetics, cosmetic manufacturing company. We're located in Portland, Oregon. Um, we are the manufacturer. So we don't just simply buy our products from China. Our whole point is to ensure that we are providing the best possible products, high quality, nourishing ingredients to consumers that have often been overlooked in the beauty space. Um, I started the business back in 2009. I self-funded for the first five and a half years. Why? Because I wanted to really build out our capacity to do the manufacturing. And that scared a lot of investors, to be really honest with you. Um, but once we reached the stage when it was time to scale, it was time to raise money. Uh, I've raised about $1.5 million. Um, I could raise a lot more than that, but I've reached a point where I know that the best path for our business um, is through other sorts of financing. And I set up our, our business and product to, um, from a gross margin perspective, to have enough margin to allow us to do a lot of the things in the business, like marketing and, and the like, as long as we're being very resourceful. Um, it's a long game for us. And so um, I've played that long game. So I'm sharing some of the tips and tools that I've learned along the way with you all in doing that. Great, thank you, Paula. And your background is as a chemist, right? Yeah, I started my career as a product development chemist. So I did work for a lot of large companies, particularly in the food and beverage space before switching over to cosmetics. So think uh, Snapple Beverages, Coca-Cola, Coca -Cola, Google, Quaker Oats, I got to a point in my career where I saw products that I had worked on maybe for a year or two sitting on store shelves, but yet as a consumer who loves beauty products was still struggling. So I decided to take my talents and to build the kind of products that I wanted to see in the marketplace. Well done. Thank you again, Paula. So great. And another example of the, the 
the quality of talent that we've assembled together for you to impart their wisdom onto you. So thank you, Paula, so much. Before we open it up for questions and move into breakouts, did you want to quickly share what your homework assignment is for everyone? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So my homework assignment is really quick and easy. I'm going to just share the screen um, really, really fast mm -hmm. just to show you. Um, all I want you to do simply is I want you to think about what technology resources you you can use to optimize your marketing efforts. Um, there are a lot of resources out there. There are companies that can do a lot of this together. So um, in, in one particular app, you have to figure out if that's the right move for you. If that company goes away, are you in a bad position or is the efficiency of having it all in, all in one place uh, the right move? So I took this slide from HubSpot, which is a resource that I love because they have a lot of free marketing courses and certifications you guys can take. Um, but they kind of show the, a marketing tech stack um, and some of the tools that, you know, might be for those things. And even for them, they're able to work across many of those streams. So that's what you're going to do for your homework. Great. Thank you so much, Paula. And I just put the link in to in the chat to your resource folder where Paula has a spreadsheet in there. Just download that so you're not editing the actual spreadsheet itself. And then remember, get your homework back to your cohort facilitators before the end of day, Wednesday of next week, before the next session. And then Paula has her open mentor hours this Tuesday, Tuesday of this coming week, the 14th at 11 a.m. So thank you, Paula, for that. Great job. A lot of valuable information that you delivered in a succinct way that I was able to follow. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Great. Okay, let's open it up for questions for Paula or for me, but let's let's open it up. You guys can just raise your hand. You can put it in the chat. Um, Paula, are you a direct to B2B or are you B2C? Um, oh, sorry. I've seen you're mm -hmm. a B2C company. We're, we're actually both. Oh, you're both. You're doing both. Okay. How does that work? Are the businesses seeing you as a person who's promoting more, um, you know, directly with the customers? Are they receptive to having your products in their um, stores when they see that's that's uh, something that I've seen um, as being a brand owner myself a long time ago? Yeah, um, I think that the 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 retailers love it. In fact, um, a lot of what they want is they want for uh, the founder, if they can get them themselves to be involved and to do in-store visits and the like. You can yeah. use influencers, but but they want to see you there as well. Um, I think it's really important for us to be on both sides of those marketplace. I went directly B2B in the beginning because I wanted to move a lot of product. Mm -hmm. um, what I found, though, is that it sometimes can be very hard to own your distribution when you have buyers who change their mind suddenly because the company is going in a different direction. So I didn't want to be caught that way. And, and so I, I've diversified across both sides. Great. I, I can relate to you as I, like I said, you know, I come from a food manufacturing background and I had the whole thing that you uh, started prior to your time, I think. Mm -hmm. um, one more quick question. Are you doing co-packing or are you specifically just dedicated to your brand, you know, in your uh, facility? Well, I've now reached a point where I do some co-packing. I've also reached a point where I do specialty work. So for instance, I did a specialty project for Monster Energy Company last year. So companies might come to me to develop something to uh, you know, help them get off the ground or launch. But I also love using my resources to help small startups. Yeah. I know how difficult it is to either find a co-packer or a manufacturer who is going to manufacture your product when you need to make it in small smaller quantities, uh, which is where the majority of consumer product good companies are. So I use some of my time for, for that as well now. Thank you so much. I will be connecting with you on that front. Thank you. A couple other questions in the chat that I'm seeing. Um, is it better to start a blog or join a blog site? I don't know if I fully understand that question. Jim, did you want to go ahead and elaborate on that a little bit more? Oh, sure. Uh, when you talk about blog, mm -hmm. is that 
where do you blog? I've never blogged. Uh, so extrapolate. Yeah, I, I think it's going to depend on your business. So for us, it's very important that we have a blog directly on our own website. Um, fortunately, our platform, we use Shopify, there's a blog already built in. So we literally just have to copy and paste the content and put the pictures in there. That works for us. There are blog networks that you can join. So there are a couple of other places where we might consider um, just having our blog so that it can be seen by eyes other than those people who come directly on our website. So I think you've got to figure out for, for yourself you know, individually which one of those scenarios or if both of those scenarios make sense for you. If you're doing both though, I can tell you sometimes it can be hard to manage both. So you probably will have to pick a lane. Okay, thank you. That help? Jarek and then Gio. Thank you. Um, Paula, uh, amazing presentation. Uh, my question kind of relates to general marketing best practices. Um, obviously, we're entrepreneurs. We're trying to be like, you know, penny wise mm -hmm. um, or, you know, pound wise, really. Um, as you look at all the different options, in your experience, is there like a certain like path where uh, we should start maybe, I don't know, with SEO, even though SEO can get really expensive, and then you layer on to get like the best kind of pound for pound value? Um, where would you start off first? And then kind of those second, third, and fourth order, you know, tools to, to get maximum leverage? Yeah. So um, that's, that's a great question, Jarek. I think about it um, as, you know, if you're thinking about where you get started, I want you to think about the buyer's journey, right? Because what you're really trying to do is connect to the buyer. You first want to do the things and be in the places where you're going to build brand awareness, right? And so, yes, SEO is good to make sure that people can discover you, right? Um, but you may also, of course, want to think about the other avenues that you can control, whether it's social media um, or other ways that you can connect and begin to get the word out and, and hopefully help that to garnish um, interest in you and you know help to spread your word in general. Um, this, so I would always start there, to be honest with you. If, if you're going to put money where you really need it as a small startup, brand awareness, brand awareness, brand awareness. Now, the next piece is engagement, right? So once they're aware of you, they begin to engage. Some people will begin to engage quicker than, than others. So you don't want to leave that out. You've got to be, you know, if someone says, hey, tell me more, you want to be able to tell them more when they're asking you more rather than saying, I'll, I'll get back to you on that, right? So you want to have that piece of the puzzle. So what I would do is I would figure out, here's my lane for brand awareness, at least initially to get started. But if someone is expressing awareness, either they're joining my newsletter, if they're coming to my website and saw something that they liked, or they saw a social media post and, and they want to know more and they want to engage with me, I then want to make sure I have that second piece, that engage piece, ready to go to engage them. So for us, if someone engagement looks like someone discovers that Hunoir has products that potentially could work for them in their skin tone and their skin needs, well, tell me more. Well, we want to make sure that they can easily come to the website and scroll or go on our Instagram and see. And then we want to allow them um, to then be able to very quickly start to identify products that might work for them. That's where they might take our AI quiz. So it was a really easy thing to add into our website to allow them to do. Um, and we're able to give them recommendations. So the hope is that by engaging that way and them seeing content too, as they reach that, that decision stage, right? And that's the other piece of the funnel. The decision stage is where they're either making a decision to purchase or they need just a little bit more information before they pull the trigger. So for us, maybe it's our return policy, um, you know, what customer reviews we have and the like, we have that ready to go. Um, and then finally, um, some people might just want a sample product. And so we, we, we try to meet them where they are at those three stages of the buyer's journey. 
So if, if you're just a long way of saying, if you're thinking about the simple things that you want to do early on to set yourself up, to be able to meet your customers at their, at whatever stage they are, just start small and just have, you know, a, a bit of each of those pieces of the puzzle ready to go. But when you're get, getting started, the biggest piece is building that brand awareness. Thank you. Amazing. Paul. Thank you. Yeah. So we've got Gio, then Susan, then we're going to go into breakout. So Gio. Hi, um, and thanks, Paula. Um, I love that name, by the way, Paula. That was my mother's name. <laughs> um, yeah, my question uh, relates around, uh, it's a little technical, so I don't know if, um, if it's useful, but I've been reading a lot about SEO and, you know, the blogging really helps with SEO, mm -hmm. but at the same time, Google is really changing the algorithms around that since everyone is using it really intensely and they're trying to get better at um, bringing users valuable content whenever you search on Google, right? Have you come across um, any strategy, future strategy around that? Uh, or yeah, just can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, yeah, I mean, I am not a technical wizard when it comes to that sort of thing, but that's why I use AI. That's why I use the platforms that I use because they are constantly evolving. And I mentioned to you, that's one of the lessons that I had to learn is that these platforms evolve as they're trying to figure out to bring better content. Um, and that's why I just encourage you to embrace some of the tools rather than trying to write and do it yourself. Um, because the tools don't need a break, right? They just need to be simply re reprogrammed to make sure that they are meeting the the, the needs of of um, a, you know a search engine like like Google and the other. So um, I I leave it to that. It's hard for me to go beyond that because honestly, this stuff changes so fast. It changes so fast. It's almost head spinning. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Yeah. So hopefully, um, maybe this can be quick. Um, Paula, just thank you for all of your insights. I was curious about um, your marketing spend, if you can share, just, I've heard a range of, um, you know, best practices kind of allocating between five to 12% of a budget for, for marketing. Whenever you can share kind of where you're at now. Oh. And if you expect when you first started out, would you have invested more or less than you did earlier on? Oh gosh, that is actually a bigger question than you probably <laughs> want right now. Um, you know what? I too have always heard, and from a lot of of folks and um, fellow business owners that I've talked to, it's somewhere between that five and twelve percent. Um, we're unfortunately in an industry where the competition um, is so fierce that it's closer to twenty five percent. That's partly why you heard me say that I've worked very hard to make sure that as I build our products, I make sure that we have a really solid, solid gross margin to make room to do that, right? Because otherwise we we wouldn't be able to do it. What you often find in our industry and in the consumer product industry is that you have a ton that you spend in marketing, but your bottom line, that net profit gets eaten up so much because you're, you know, 2Xing or almost 3Xing that expense. So I'll just answer that by, by saying it's just really important whatever you do and what we did from the very beginning is we just made sure that we stayed in line with our capability so like Jarek's example we knew we didn't have a ton of resources so let's put our money where we potentially can see the biggest bang for our buck um, early on. And we took advantage of, of Earn Media. So Caroline in her presentation talked about, um, you know, setting up uh, desk sides and, and those sorts of things to start to get the word out or pitching the business of publications. I did a ton of that. I went to New York and I would spend three weeks with meetings where I just did desk side after desk side, helping to get us positioned, also making sure that we built awareness. So we I, we took advantage of, of opportunities whenever we could to help with that spend. Awesome. Thank you, Paula. Great questions. You guys remember to attend her. Hopefully you are available for her Tuesday open mentor hour. That invite has already been sent out that you will get more and more time with the amazing Paula. 
Okay, so we're going to hop into the breakouts, and I just want to pull this up again to remind everybody, um, your cohort facilitators will have this link on their end. We're going to borrow from the branding expertise of the Four Seasons. So this is their statement. I'm just going to read the first part. We have chosen to specialize within the hospitality industry by offering only experiences of exceptional quality. Our objective is to be recognized as the company that manages the finest hotels, resorts, and residence clubs wherever we locate. Okay, so we're going to focus on that part. This would be the full ad lib if you were filling it out. But for sake of our exercise that we're about ready to jump into, this is what you're going to focus on. And we only have about 12 minutes. So maybe you guys can kind of move through them quickly. Go with what comes top of mind. There's, you know, there's no really right or wrong answer here. It's just getting that branding muscle going. So we have chosen to specialize within the blank industry by offering only exceptional blank our ex and try and not do just service, right? Like take, take back here what we learned from, um, from the four seasons, right? They're saying experiences of exceptional quality, right? So just sort of think a little bit more about that. And then our objective is to be recognized as the company that blank. That's really the clincher right there is that last one is what is it that you want to be recognized for? That's where you'll start to think about what words you want to own in the mind of the consumer. So with that, we're gonna hop in breakout rooms. I'm gonna open them in a second. Sierra is out, so her group is going to hang back with me. Jenny and Anjit, you're welcome to join any group that you want. When I pull up the breakout rooms, you'll see the breakout room number plus the name of the cohort facilitator that you would like to join, which obviously Paula has one of her sessions. You're welcome to join hers. We have 12 minutes. You'll have a uh, 60 second Warning, we'll come back and we'll just talk about the next session that's next week with uh, Lindy from Rational Unicorn and then also any answer any other questions you have. So with that, I'm going to open the rooms and enjoy the exercise. And remember for folks, um, you have to, if it doesn't pop up right away, go down to the bottom bar where the breakout rooms are and just click on that and it will pop up. So Sierra's group will remain back with me. And we'll see you in about 12 minutes. And Anjit and Jenny, you're also welcome to stay in the main session if you would prefer. Your call. Anybody having any issues finding the breakout room? Okay. Great. Okay, well, hello, Sierra's group. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? Good. Good, yeah. good, great. Well, let me pull up the um, the fun ad lib and who would like to go first? It's fun. You can cut, we can help you through it. You don't have to know it right off the top of your head. Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. I feel like we've already kind of um, we've already worked through this a bit. So we have chosen to specialize within the wellness industry by offering only exceptional information and tools. Our objective is to be recognized as the company that. <sighs> oh, I, oh, I lost it, but it's it's right in it's right there in my in the window. Um, <laughs> makes the management of me made simple. Hmm. I like and that. And we use, we use me intentionally as in, yes, even though I'm the one reading it, when you hear it in your mind, you're thinking me. Oh, I like that. I like that. By the way, I usually, when the breakout session is in this, I can choose to stop the recording if you guys want, or we can leave it running for educational purposes. Does anyone feel strongly? All I need is one person to say they don't want us to record the breakout and I will turn it off. I want to honor everybody. So there is... No problem if you would like it turned off. Sorry, Caroline, I'm still, um, I, I don't know which breakout room I was supposed to be part of. You can, you're welcome to stay here if you like. Yeah. Okay. And so, I can go next. Go for it. Um, we've chosen to specialize within the nonprofit industry by offering only exceptional um, technology solutions. Our objective is to be recognized as the company that knows the struggles of nonprofit from A to Z. 
Mm, nice. I like that. So I, I have, I have an understanding of what you're, what you're doing, helping nonprofits. You've been through it before. It's yeah. all the tech stuff that most nonprofits are terrible at <laughs> yeah. and need to outsource that. Yeah. Great. Nice job, Sunita. Thank you. Anyone else want to take a stab? Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. Okay. I don't feel like mine's sexy yet. Let's see. We have okay. two within the internet safety industry by offering only exceptional education and training. Now, our objective is to be recognized as the company that helps parents manage online safety for kids. Mm, well done. That's right. Very clear. And think about it. Like, think about how hard it is to describe what your company does sometimes to people. So when you have this structure that ties into like branding statements so that you can take these things and put them into other areas of marketing and promotion. It's really great. Nice job. So um, Caroline, this can be part of your uh, mission as well, right? It can be. Yeah. If it, if it makes sense, like our mission is to blah, 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 blah. And if there's yeah. pieces of it that work out for sure. Okay. But this is, um, we should probably look at this as primarily a marketing message about the brand. This exercise is we're just borrowing from the brand geniuses and the hundreds of millions that the, um, the four seasons spends on branding yeah. and positioning as that leader in luxury and hospitality and service. Yeah. 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 Anyone else want to take a stab? I can, I can try, definitely. Okay. okay, so we have chosen to specialize within the talent development industry in multinational companies or um, organizations by offering only exceptional global cross-cultural leadership and engagement tools, systems, and training our objective is to be recognized as a company that leverages the power of identity and purpose to create relevant engagement. Nice. Great job. From inside out. Okay. That's great. Yes. And might need a little more fine tuning, but I feel like I have a yeah. really good understanding of, of what you're focusing on. Nice work, Anna. Thanks. Great. Anyone else want to take a stab? Gio. <laughs> sure. Um, so I just wrote it right now. Um, we have chosen the, to specialize within the shared travel industry by offering exceptional features focused on safety. Our objective is to be recognized as a company that makes shared travel frictionless. That makes what travel? Shared travel. Shared travel frictionless. Okay. Can you read yours again for me, please? We have chosen to specialize within the shared travel industry by offering exceptional features focused on safety. Our objective is to be recognized as a company that makes shared travel frictionless. Great. Okay. Tell us a little more about your company. Uh, we are connecting trusted travelers for shared accommodation. Okay. Now lean into the safety piece. Um, what do you mean? Like you want me to elaborate on what? Yeah. What, what, like I, if I want to do shared and and also what you mean by shared travel shared travel with by connecting or making it easy to connect with others for shared accommodation like i i walk me through like how i what i would do on your website um so you would verify yourself because our component or at least our features really want to emphasize on focus uh, on safety and so once you verify yourself, you're going to be able to propose a trip or a shared accommodation among other trusted travelers. Okay. And the safety pieces that you're doing, like some sort of, are you doing a social media scraping to find out more about who we are or how are you validating that? Or yeah. Right. So based off our research, um, there's three components. Um, shared interest, mutual connections, and verifications, multiple verifications. Um, so maybe maybe by offering exceptional like safety protocols or multiple safety protocols or something, just elaborate more on the on that safety piece, but that was great. Nice job, Gio. Thank you. Thank you. 
Who else didn't go? Andre, Sunil? Yeah, go ahead. Um, we have chosen to specialize within the wellness tech industry by offering only exceptional engaging experiences when it comes to maintaining your well-being. Our objective is to be recognized as a company that empowers individuals on their path of personal growth through companionship-based products. Hmm. I like that, the companion-based products. Tell us and remind us a little more about what, what those are. Yeah, so we're creating like the Neopet of mental health and stress and anxiety management. Um, so it'll be a digital virtual pet that helps you uh, with engaging breathing experiences. Yes, and congratulations again on winning the pitch clinic competition. That Thanks. was awesome. Appreciate it. Yeah, I meant to actually mention that when we go back. Your company, is it Panion? Yes. Panion, okay. Awesome, thank you. Sunal. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say I need a little more time to think about it. That's a that's okay. Take take more time to think about it. Sunita, did you? Were, yeah. You know? Um, and this is, question is for Andre. Um, is your product um available for people to sign up? Is it ready? It is. Yes, it's available for sign up. Um, and it'll be launching next month. Okay, I want to ask my daughter to download and you know play with it a little bit. So yeah, I've been getting those emails. I signed up last session. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you all. Sunita, you, I'll send you a message. Sure. Thank you. That's why I also want to connect you guys through a channel, right? So that you yeah. can ask each other to sign up. You can ask for feedback. You can consider potential ways of partnering and, and yeah. maybe even find co-founders and share talent, those kinds of things. Yeah. Right. I did that in my startup where we couldn't afford our one tech guy, but we shared him with another startup and we got him on Mondays and Tuesdays. They got him on Thursdays and Wednesday or Wednesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. So great place for all of those so thank you yeah absolutely any did we get to everybody so no it's gonna go i think next uh, i think i don't have it in a prepared form it's more like a social media industry where i want to focus on privacy and uh, better mental health so uh, current social media platforms are more um uh, you know, uh, affecting our mental health. So it's it's a somewhat of a wellness industry with social media uh, involved in it. So I need to uh, form it a little better. I don't have it. I couldn't do it right now. So. That's totally fine. Can you just talk more freely about your company? Yeah, the, the idea is to uh, have a social media platform, but it's not totally public like Facebook or Instagram. It's more like a private uh, sort of like a mix of social media with uh, journaling where you are journaling thoughts and memories from your day-to-day -day life and you're sharing with a limited set of folks each journal each memory that you're writing is uh, really limited to a group of folks that you share that memory with and that way you're capturing the memories but it's not uh, like public uh, and the mental wellness part to it is that you are Every day you are journaling in this social media app and that way you have more gratitude for all the things that you are doing. And, you know, in general, there are benefits to journaling. So, Got it. That's great. I love the idea of like pulling journaling into social media. It, I feel like it adds more authenticity right. to to the process. I don't I don't know of anything, any other app out there, any other social media app out there like that. Does anyone else? We lost your sound, Caroline. Oh, can you hear me? No, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry, was it just me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's check. Great job, you guys. That was, and it's not always easy to just hop into that. Looks like we have, the rooms are going to close in like nine seconds. And I I can't recall if the 60 minute warning starts after that or not, but um, let's see. Close all rooms. Okay, now they have a one minute warning. So 60 second warning, folks are coming back in. Uh, can I ask a question while people come in? Of course, Anna. So for the pitches and to be able to identify people with possible investors, are you going to choose, I don't know, 50% of us 
60%, like, is that a predetermined number? It's it's a competitive or is more like the most people that you can mix with investors? So how are you going to do yeah, that? Great question. The number doesn't matter. What matters okay. is the the quality of right. the, the pitch, the content, the founder. Mm -hmm. And those are really good questions because Anjit and I, we were just talking about that. Like, what is the criteria that we want to yeah, use? Yeah. You know, we, we know what the due diligence requirements are that investors want to see. And so, yeah, no, that's a really great question. So thanks for awesome. asking that. Yeah, we've got everybody coming back in. Um, we're a minute over, so we're just hopefully going to just wrap it up in another minute or two here. Let's see, is everybody back? Looks like just about everybody is back. So hopefully that was a good exercise that, you know, just sort of helping hone in and get more specific around those descriptive words. Um, I love doing that exercise and I think it's a fun way to just sort of jump into a brand and even pick a brand that you know in the market and do that with it and, and fill it out. Okay, so as we conclude, again, thank you, Paula, for your great presentation. Um, please join her on Tuesday, the 14th at 11 a.m. for her open mentor hour. Next week, we've got our amazing Lindy from um, Rational Unicorn, who's going to be talking about term sheets and also some more. We're, we're based on some of the questions that we've received. She and I are going to have a conversation and we'll have more specifics on the, um, the legal side of the presentation that's going to happen. We already talked about the homework. Uh, always a good reminder to um, focus on the graduation criteria, right? Seven out of 10 sessions, attend at least half of the open mentor hours, submit at least half of the homework. And then through the pitch coaching, those who are fund ready will get referred to the Portland Seed Fund. They're reserving three to 5 million to invest in companies like you, which is a really amazing thing. Um, I also want to take a moment and congratulate Andre Stone, who... Uh, the founder of Panion, the CEO who won the pitch competition that we did when we did the pitch clinic. So congratulations to you, Andre. You did such a good job and set a good tone. And I was talking to another entrepreneur recently who said, how do I do a good pitch? I said, watch this pitch clinic and then watch all of these entrepreneurs pitch and listen to the feedback that they got. So you did a really good job there. I also want to thank our guest, Jenny Kelly from the Kauffman Foundation for joining us and Anjit with um, who's going to be a pitch coach with all of you. And also a huge shout out to all of our mentors, our cohort facilitators for showing up. And you guys, we had up to 83 on the call today. I, it was the largest amount since we first started. So I feel really good that you feel like we're giving you good content and that you're coming back. So thank you for that. Paula, you had your hand up. Did you wanna say something? Yeah, just one uh, quick correction. Um, the the mentor session is at 12 noon on Tuesday. The invitation is oh. already, already set for 12 noon. I'm fine with that. I was thinking of it as a lunchtime hour. Yes, thank anyway. you. Sorry, I had 11 on the slide, but yep. the invite went out for noon, correct? Yep. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Okay, well, great work, you guys. Um, thank you again for showing up, everybody. I will stay on for a few more minutes as I usually do and hang back if people have any questions and we will stop the recording. Have a great day, you guys. See you next week. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.